In this video we are going to discuss how the military power of the different sides are going to interact with each other in our speculation about World War III. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Military power is not merely related to the number and the quality of the assets available. These are more a consequence than a cause. Modern military power has deep roots in the industrial base of a country, in its universities, and in the character of the people. If all this is present and thriving, if there is consensus around creating a military power, then effective military organizations, properly equipped and motivated and trained, can be created by any advanced country. However, this process takes time and effort, and the competitors usually do not stand still, but they move, and they move in different directions. For ages, military might has been expressed with numbers. When machines did not play a larger role in war, the number of men and their equipment was the measure of military force. When organizations became important, the number of regiments or the number of divisions was the measure. When machines and technology started having an important role in war, it was still units and the level of their equipment. In the modern world, we use the concept of capability. Capability, as we define it, it is being able to execute a specific mission that is required to achieve an intermediate or a final objective as defined by the victory conditions established for that conflict. Capability is not an abstract quality of military forces, it is something which is specific to the execution of a mission. In modern warfare, capability is available if a side can execute a usually long and complex chain of related tasks in the face of the enemy, and to do so normally a wide range of assets of all kind may be necessary. High value assets are those that can execute the tasks despite the enemy opposition or conversely can adapt to execute different tasks to provide a range of capabilities when needed. Capability can be available globally for, for example the USA and other large powers or in a specific area only which is the majority of the cases. There is also a temporal dimension to capability. A capability may be available just once, or can be available a limited number of times, or many times, or in a given time frame. Also, capability can be expressed with a positive or a negative spin. Some capabilities are aimed at executing tasks and achieving results, some other just negate or contrast the opponent's capabilities. The USA is currently in the process of reorienting its capabilities toward large-scale operations in an expeditionary context. Deploying heavy ground and air forces almost everywhere in the world for a relatively prolonged period of time uh, by controlling the seas and the airspace is the underlying key signature capability of the United States. Since the United States do not have an enemy close to their door, but they have interests of all the world, they can focus on their expeditionary capabilities. The capability to establish control on the sea is assured by a powerful navy with unparalleled capabilities like the carrier battle groups. Sea denial is guaranteed by the largest fleet of nuclear submarines in the world. Air dominance is assured by large numbers of the most advanced fighters ever built in history. 
strike and attack missions are covered by the same platforms with the addition of a shrinking but always effective fleet of bombers. Cruise missiles and the new hypersonic weapons provide or will provide a long range and unmanned additional stray capability. Very hard to stop. The army, while not as heavy or as large as it used to be during the Cold War, is a modern and well-trained force. Its equipment is among the most modern and most effective in the world. The Marine Corps provides a strategic intervention capability again unmatched by any other nation. The weak spot of the United States Armed Force is that to support all this high technology equipment, you need an enormous industrial base and huge amounts of resources. Used to this abundance of material means, United States forces consume enormous amounts of expensive supplies uh, in their missions, and this will be the subject of an entire video. The other members of the Western Alliance are all different and each one of them has different capabilities. These as a whole are not dissimilar to the United States in effectiveness, but they heavily differ in time and durability. The major European countries, plus Japan, Korea, Canada, Australia and so on, do have capabilities similar to the United States but quantities, ranges, timelines are much different and, well, in general, worse. A country, say, like Italy, has a number of modern assets that can provide a similar capability as a marine expeditionary force with all its escorts. The difference is that after a few months of operation, the, an Italian task force will be depleted and it will require a very long time to be brought back to full strength. This is not even guaranteed to be possible because some assets, if lost, may in practice be irreplaceable. The United States, conversely, well, will probably just replace a marine expeditionary force with another one. However, the level of integration reached by NATO and the Eastern Allies is truly remarkable. It is quite common to have units down to battalion level to fight in multinational brigades. Air mission packages where each type of plane is provided by a different country. And naval formations where each ship is from a different country. So while there will still be logistical inefficiencies, the combined allied forces can definitely deploy modern and effective capabilities if required. While as a GDP percentage the military budget of China has been lower than 2% since the 90s, the snowballing GDP has brought an actual increase of about 12 times in the same period. China has pursued and successfully achieved a wide range of capabilities. The focus has moved from defensive and ground operations uh, with a large component based on infantry and artillery to a sophisticated multi-domain force with a good degree of similarity with the Western counterparts. China has the strategic problem of the chains of islands that guard the access to the Pacific Ocean and the maritime uh, routes. So, a great effort has been poured into building new and effective air and naval capabilities to operate in that area. The PLA of the mid-2020s will be able to conduct air superiority missions with stealth fighters and long-range weapons. It will have KTOBAR aircraft carriers in service, albeit in small numbers, uh, which enable the sea control capability and allow to conduct offensive missions, offensive operations against uh, opposing navies and the bases on the chain of islands. It will have the capability of conducting long-range strikes 
with ballistic and cruise missiles against sea and land targets. It will have a submarine fleet capable of conducting sea denial missions even at a distance from the Chinese coast. It will also have a network-centric capability in place to effectively act as a force multiplier. The land forces have evolved toward a combined arms heavy force whose equipment should be considered the high end of the Russian-derived weapons. While roots and traditions will still be there, the Russian armed force in the 2020s will be very different from the Soviet forces. While traditionally Russians have always resorted to large numbers of relatively lower technology equipment, this approach cannot be sustained anymore in the 2020s. Russia, whose military technology has always been second only to the USA, has put the time passed by the fall of the Soviet Union to good use, closing many gaps and, in some cases, moving ahead of the competition. Russia has the capability to field a relatively large ground force with modern or acceptable equipment and a greater firepower than any Western army. While training is not always excellent, Russian ground forces can conduct mechanized offensive and defensive operations in Europe. This capability, though, may be constrained by the limited availability of long-range transport assets. While in the European theater it is conceivable that Russian forces could move in large numbers deep in enemy territory, in Asia there could only be a limited availability of logistic assets, thus limiting the number of heavy forces in the theater. To partially mitigate this, Russia has a well-developed capability in terms of air mobile forces and special forces, which can be used at longer ranges. Russia can contrast Western air dominance uh, with two distinct capabilities. A relatively large air force with modern locally built planes, which can be a match for the Western counterparts, and the largest surface to air defensive network, which is considered to be the most effective in the world. The Russian Navy is relatively small and some of the major units are really old remains of the Soviet Navy. It has a very limited capability to challenge the United States and the West uh, in the arena of sea control. However, the relatively large a uh, number of modern nuclear uh, attack submarines can deploy an effective sea denial capability worldwide. And finally, Russia has a strong strike capability thanks to a series of new long-range weapons like cruise and hypersonic weapons which render part of the Western air defense capability well, obsolete. This was a very high-level overview, but it appears clearly that we are going to have a type of confrontation which is not new at all. Continental powers against maritime and expeditionary powers. An interesting confrontation indeed. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.